The hearing will come to order. The House Natural Resources Committee meets today to hear testimony on an oversight hearing entitled The Federal Columbia River Power System, The Economic Lifeblood and Way of Life for the Pacific Northwest. By way of introduction, I'm Doug Lamborn, the chairman of the House Natural Resources Committee Subcommittee on Water, Power, and Oceans. I also represent the 5th District of Colorado. I'm grateful to be joined by two former members of the committee who represent this region and are extremely familiar with these issues, Representatives Dan Newhouse and Kathy McMorris Rogers, both from Washington. To begin today's hearing, I will now defer to my distinguished colleague, Dan Newhouse, who represents Tri-Cities, for a brief statement and a few introductions. Well, good morning. Uh, I want to say welcome to Central Washington, particularly to Chairman Lamborn and to uh, uh, Congresswoman Morris Rogers. Thank you. Well, it's truly a beautiful day here in the Tri-Cities in Pasco, Washington. I'm very proud that this is uh, my district, the fourth con congressional district. I'm also uh, very happy to see, see so many members of the community here uh, who are truly engaged in a very, very important issue for not only our community, but for our state, really for the whole Pacific Northwest, and I would even venture to say for our nation. As you know, many of you were with us outside just before the hearing began. Uh, a lot of community members uh, besides yourselves were together and we were serenaded by a group of uh, young members of our community with, uh, you probably know this, but the state folk song, Washington State's folk song that uh, Woody Guthrie, uh, uh, Jem, Roll On Columbia. And what a, what a perfect, perfect song for today's hearing. A uh, great way to kick off the morning proceedings as well. So I, I simply want to say thank you, Mr. Lamborn, Mr. Chairman, for being here today, agreeing to uh, chair and host this important meeting. And now since this is a, an official congressional hearing, we're going to begin as we do every session of the House of Representatives with a prayer and a posting of the colors and the Pledge of Allegiance. So first, I would like to recognize Mr. Wes Hershberger of the Grandview Church of the Nazarene to lead us in prayer. Pastor. Thank you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we seek today to honor you. After all, you are the creator and the provider of all of the gifts that we enjoy here today. Guide our minds and our hearts as we strive together to serve you and to serve our communities. May you grant us wisdom so that we will be able to see all of the facets of all of the issues that we face together. May you provide a depth of understanding as we listen, not just to respond, but to hear. If our minds need to change, I pray today that we would be ready to release our strongly held opinions for the good of our community. I pray today that we would discover with gratitude that we have been blessed to serve and that those that we serve best are those that we perhaps will never meet, our posterity. And I pray that today we would serve them well. As we step into this day, I pray that, uh, that you would bless our conversation with the right measure of humility and tenacity, with the right measure of generosity and reserve, with the right measure of liberality and conservation, with the right measure of giving and investment. And as we work toward all of this to, together, I pray that you would help us to discover the strength and power of agreement. May the winds that are crafted here and beyond this day be valued for generations to come. And may people be blessed because of the service that is offered here from our hearts today to yours. Amen. So if you remain standing, um, I'm now proud to recognize the Pasco Boy Scout <laughs> Troop 159 to post the colors and to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Colors. 
the color. Will you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Representative Newhouse. We will now begin with brief opening statements, as is our tradition, uh, starting with myself. The committee meets today to conduct an oversight hearing entitled The Federal Columbia River Power System, The Economic Lifeblood and Way of Life for the Pacific Northwest. What often gets lost in the conversations inside the Beltway is the impact that this federal infrastructure has on the lives of real people and the immense value the Federal Columbia River Power System creates for the region. Only since the early 1990s has the system become a partisan issue. Construction of Bonneville and Grand Coulee dams was a centerpiece of President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. When President Roosevelt dedicated the Bonneville Dam in September 1937, he stated that, quote, in the construction of this dam, we have had our eyes on the future of the nation. Its cost will be returned to the people of the United States many times over in the improvement of navigation and transportation, the cheapening of electrical power, and the distribution of this power to hundreds of small communities within a great radius. As I look upon Bonneville Dam today, I cannot help the thought that we in America are wiser in using our wealth on projects like this, which will give us more wealth, better living, and greater happiness for our children." End quote. Eleven years later, speaking about the role that hydroelectric dams in the Pacific Northwest played in the United States' World War II efforts, Republican President Harry Truman stated that, quote, had we not had that power source, it would have been almost impossible to win this war, unquote. From the days of early settlers in the region to the exploration of Lewis and Clark, through World War II and into the modern day, the story of the Pacific Northwest and the Columbia Snake River system is uniquely American. Those of us in Congress owe it to you all here today to make good on the promises of the past and to do everything we can to protect this critical infrastructure that makes possible the way of life in the Pacific Northwest. Before I conclude my statement, I want to give a special thanks to Representatives Dan Newhouse and Kathy McMorris Rogers, who have been passionate and effective advocates for you back in Washington, D.C. They work tirelessly to defend your livelihoods and the critical infrastructure that promotes a strong regional economy and way of life. In fact, we are having this hearing today at their urging, so Congress can be better informed on the critical issues facing the Pacific Northwest. So I want to thank our witnesses also here, uh, all nine of them, for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. I look forward to your testimony on all sides of the critical issues facing the Federal Columbia River Power System. I now recognize, because we're in his district, Representative Dan Newhouse for his opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairman Lamborn. And again, thank you to all of you that are here today. You know, over the, over the past few days, members of our community from throughout central and eastern Washington uh, gathered to participate in what we've called the River Fest, our rivers, our way of life. It's been an important opportunity to celebrate all the benefits our communities receive from the Snake and Columbia Rivers, as well as to educate the general public on all of these benefits. This past Saturday, I, along with thousands of community members, visited dozens of booths and exhibits with community partners and organizations highlighting all of the gifts that our rivers provide. I requested this hearing, Chairman, of the House National Natural Resources Committee to coincide with these community events because I believe it's important that Congress is educated about how vital our federal river power system is to the Pacific Northwest. The Columbian Snake Rivers and the Federal Columbia River Power System provide irrigation for Washington's agricultural industry, 
navigational routes for our export-driven economy, and flood control for our local communities. The system provides clean, renewable, affordable power and provides for thriving recreational, manufacturing, and technology industries. These rivers truly are the economic lifeblood of the Pacific Northwest. Unfortunately, in my opinion, misguided movements continue to push for the destruction or the degradation of our river power system. Along with my colleague, Representative McMorris Rogers, and other Pacific Northwest bipartisan colleagues, I've been working on legislative efforts to protect this system and our hydroelectric dams. As you know, a single federal judge in 2016 overturned the plan which governs the operations and salmon protection management plans for the river system. This plan was the product of painstaking negotiations conducted by both the Bush and the Obama administrations. Scientists and engineering experts at federal agencies affected states, as well as sovereign Northwest tribes and many local stakeholders. The judge not only mandated that the breaching of the dams be considered as an option, but he has even stepped in to override the scientists and the engineers who run this system and is now singularly dictating how the dams are managed, including going against the scientific analysts, analysis and ordering forced spill to maximum level, known as the gas caps. Spilling at these gas caps not only threaten the reliability of the federal power and transmission system and cause detrimental impacts to transportation and barging to flood control and irrigation, there are also scientific studies warning that the increased gas levels harm the very fish that species that we're trying to protect. Six months ago, I sent a request to Washington's senators, both Patty Murray and Maria Cantwell, warning of the $40 million bill that was estimated to fall on the backs of our constituents due to the spill order and ask them to join us in our efforts to save our dams. Unfortunately, that action did not take place. And in the end, a $38.6 million bill landed on the backs of Washington ratepayers. Ratepayers could be facing the exact same bill this coming year if the senators do not join our efforts. So I'm doing everything in my power to protect ratepayers in central Washington from introducing legislation to protect the dams, which is, I'm proud to say, is now passed the House and awaits action by the Senate, to drafting an appropriations provision that stops the reckless spill order, and then to requesting today's hearing. And I will not stop working on behalf of this vital system. It is my hope for this hearing today that a national audience will learn more about the myriad of benefits our river system provides and how our rivers truly do provide for our way of life. I look forward very much to hearing all of your testimony. And I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers for her opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn. It's great to be with my colleague, Representative Dan Newhouse. We are delighted to have everyone here today and I appreciate the opportunity to join in celebrating the river system. Congress created the Bonneville Power Administration BPA in 1937 on the heels of the Great Depression to distribute power generated from the development of two federally authorized dams, Bonneville and Grand Coulee. These marvels of engineering provided the Pacific Northwest with the nation's most affordable and most reliable energy. In 1945, Congress authorized the construction of four large dams along the Snake River, Ice Harbor, Laura Monumental, Little Goose, and Lower Granite, to grow what we call the Federal Columbia River Power System. These four dams can power nearly two million homes, or a city the size of Seattle, and provide reliable base load, important energy to meet BPA's peak loads during the hottest days in the summer, when the wind doesn't blow, or the coldest part of winter when the sun doesn't shine. We have a positive story to tell about how our dams bring incredible benefits and have transformed a dry, barren region of sagebrush into one of the most productive in the country. 
In Washington State, hydropower provides almost 70 percent of our electricity needs, and it's clean and renewable. Our dams also provide barging and irrigation benefits for our number one industry, agriculture, flood control for our communities, and recreational opportunities. Washington State is the most trade dependent state in the country. An estimated 40 percent of our jobs are tied to trade, responsible for nearly $80 billion worth of exports. Our river system functions as a super highway, employing 40,000 people in various capacities throughout our system of dams and locks. It would take 174,000 semi trucks to move the goods which travel by barge each year. One barge equals 134 trucks. Barging provides efficient, cost effective, and low carbon flow of commerce. Despite all these benefits, we face significant challenges. Some argue that the four lower Snake River dams in particular have negatively impacted migratory fish, yet the data shows average fish, fish survival rates of 97 percent. It's also important to note that of the 13 fish listed under the ESA, only four species pass these dams. These record fish survival rates are a significant result of federal research and investments in new technologies like fish friendly turbines, new passage technologies, and modified operations. In addition, we have implemented with Northwest states and tribes massive habitat restoration. All of this comes at a cost. Around one third of BPA's wholesale power costs go to fish and wildlife projects. 621 million on fish and operations, fish operations and fish and wildlife projects in 2016. Hmm. Now, due to a judge's decision in Portland, the region is spilling even more water over the dams, a mandate that will cost ratepayers a, a, an estimated $38 million. Why is this judge ignoring science? Why is this judge ignoring years of work in biological, on a biological opinion to satisfy the court demands? Collaboration among federal agencies, tribes, states, utilities, river users from the Pacific Northwest. This overreach by the courts is why I sponsored the bipartisan bill, H.R. 3144, that passed this committee to stop senseless spills. In eastern Washington, we understand the benefits of healthy salmon runs. That's why we've invested in research and new technologies and habitat restoration. We were all saddened to see the recent death of a newborn baby orca whale off the coast of Washington. However, the four lower Snake River dams didn't cause the whale to die. In fact, the Army Corps estimates that the dams would have a potential 2% impact on orca recovery. The larger impacts are ocean conditions and pollution. In order to protect orca whales and get them the salmon that they need, 50% of their diet, let's focus on what is actually going to get results. In addition, we should also consider the impact of hatchery fish, orcas who cannot tell the difference between hatchery and wild salmon, and yet we've reduced hatchery production. A recent NOAA and Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife report stated that recovering 12 western Washington rivers are more important to orca whale and they provide the majority of the Chinook they need to eat, not the Snake River. Another NOAA report states, and I quote, while Chinook salmon population in places such as the Columbia River are surging, other populations like Puget Sound Chinook and Sacramento River renter winter run Chinook are struggling. Last year, the Ninth Circuit mandated an experimental spill operation to test their theory that it would improve fish passage. This experiment is not based on science. In fact, science shows that too much spill will actually kill fish through increased gas bubbles in the water. Through the decades, the delegation from the Pacific Northwest has come together to protect and promote the value of the Columbia Snake River system to our region. I appeal to my colleagues, House and Senate, Democrat and Republican, that we come together now 
and stop the courts from mandating theories not based on science that only add additional costs to ratepayers in our communities. The House of Representatives has passed three significant bills to support our dams. This includes legislation to support the collaborative biop, a proposal to stop the costly spill requirement, and Representative Herrera Butler's and Senator Risch seal lion predation bill. We have a lot to consider. I stand ready to listen to my colleagues' ideas and everyone here today to help fish, orcas, recreation, clean power and low rates, transportation, agriculture, our economy and our environment. The fact of the matter is that dams and fish coexist. Let's keep looking forward to a future that builds upon our economy and our environment and a great quality of life. And I yield back. Thank you. Now, before we hear from our invited witnesses, I want to take a moment to urge the audience to submit written comments that will be printed in the hearing record and will become part of the official hearing record. We want to include as many comments as possible. So there are comment forms at the room entrance, and you can also submit comments at our website, which is www.naturalresources.house.gov under contact us. We want to hear from you, and if you have any questions on how to do this, uh, please see one of our staff members who are uh, with us here today. So I will now introduce today's witnesses. Our first witness is the former chairman of the Natural Resources Committee, the Honorable Doc Hastings from Pasco, Washington. Our second witness is Mr. Dan James, Deputy Administrator for the Bonneville Power Administration from Portland, Oregon. Our third witness is Ms. Terry Flores, Executive Director of Northwest River Partners from Portland, Oregon. Our fourth witness is Mr. Chris Johnson, President and CEO of the Association of Washington Business from Olympia, Washington. Our fifth witness is Glenn H. Spain, Northwest Regional Director of the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations from Eugene, Oregon. Our sixth witness is Mr. Rob Rich, Vice President of Marine Services for Shaver Transportation from Portland, Oregon. Our seventh witness is the Honorable McCoy Oatman, Vice Chairman of the Nez Perce Tribe from Lapway, Idaho. Lapway, okay. Um, uh, excuse me for uh, mangling that, that, uh, that word. Our eighth witness is Mr. Jack Heffling, President of the United Power Trades Organization from West Richland, Washington. And our final witness is, is Ms. Marcy Green, President of the Washington Association of Wheat Growers from Ritzville, Washington. Each witness's written testimony will appear in full in the hearing record, so I ask that witnesses keep their oral statements to five minutes, as outlined in our invitation letter to you and under Committee Rule 4A. I also want to explain how our timing lights work. When you begin to speak, our clerk will start the timer and a green light will appear. After four minutes, a yellow light will appear, and at that time, you should speed up and begin to conclude your remarks. And at five minutes, the red light will come on, and I would ask that you conclude at that time. Congressman Hastings, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And before, uh, if I may, before uh, we start the uh, official clock, uh, just let me give you a bit of history here. Is your you computer, mentioned. Is it on? Yeah. It is? No, I mean, is it? Yeah. Okay. There, oh, that I, sounds I, better. I get closer. <laughs> If I may, before the official uh, clock starts, just give you a bit of history here. You mentioned that I am from Pasco. As a matter of fact, I spent my childhood about six blocks from here. And the building that you're in right here used to be the high school. But uh, when I was uh, going to, to junior high, it was the junior high. And this, this room right here is where the old gym was. So just a little, <laughs> bit, of, just a little bit of background. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank you, and it's nice to see my former colleague, uh, Ms. McMorris Rogers, uh, here, and my Congressman Dan Newhouse, and I thank you for having this hearing today. I appreciate the opportunity to testify about the importance of protecting the Northwest hydropower uh, dams and the economic and environmental benefits they produce for our region and our nation. Six years ago, when I chaired this committee, we had a similar hearing to discuss my legislation on these dams. And I'm pleased that the committee uh, has continued focus on this issue. BPA's unsustainable financial situation requires a legislative solution aimed at putting a halt to ongoing litigation and shoring up the value of our region's greatest carbon hydropower resource. 
My testimony focuses on two basic points. The need to advance the House ba passed bipartisan legislation that uses best available federal science to effectively stop an unelected federal judge from running the river and halt edicts by extreme groups intent on misusing the ESA to remove dams. And secondly, to highlight the hypocrisy of those that downgrade hatchery salmon as so far as, as inferior to wild salmon. First, I commend and strongly support your efforts to pass H.R. 3144 to codify the 2014 buy-up, buy, uh, an opinion that's supported by scientists, three different administrations, states, tribes, ports, and many more. The Senate needs to take up this legislation, and if they don't, I would encourage you to find a vehicle to attach it to before the end of this Congress. So let me set aside for a moment the role of dams because that will be well documented by the other witnesses. A continuing irony is that a vast majority of returning salmon to most areas of the Columbia and Snake River come from hatcheries. Hatcheries have been used for more than a century, decades longer than dams have been around. Yet some extreme groups say that there is a difference between so-called wild and hatchery bred salmon. They claim hatchery salmon are inferior and negatively impact wild salmon. They filed ESA-related uh, lawsuits to shut down tribal and state hatcheries, which actually would help recover salmon. Well, this flies in the face of a number of scientific studies in the ESA itself. For example, a 2012 peer-reviewed scientific study conducted by the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission and Nez Perce tribal scientists found that hatchery fish did not negatively impact the fitness of wild fish and that hatchery fish can successfully boost populations with little, if any, negative impacts. And over a decade ago, 10 independent fishery scientists representing a range of educational institutions and agencies found that hatchery fish successfully repro reproduce in the wild and found no evidence that they ne negatively impact wild salmon. In fact, they found that hatchery fish are indistinguishable when interbred with wild populations. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask consent to make that part of the record, if I may. With no objection, so ordered. Many groups also focus on the declines of wild salmon. While primarily falling dams for salmon declines, they look the other way as huge numbers of wild salmon, ESA-listed salmon, are harvested. In a recent report to the Northwest Power Council, NOAA acknowledged that as much as 19% of Snake River steelhead, 43%, nearly half, of Snake River Fall Chinook, and 53%, over half, of Lower Columbia Fall uh, Chinook are now harvested in the ocean or the river. These staggering numbers run contrary to the ent of, intent of ESA. We are, in fact, harvesting an ESA-listed species. So now it's time for Congress to step up and offer solutions such as 3144 that you alluded to. And let me suggest too that there is a model for this, and the model is the American buffalo. We all know how iconic the American buffalo was uh, and, and how it roamed the Great Plains. And we knew that the, uh, the uh, Native Americans used buffalo as a food source and also as a clothing source. And we know that when we settled the West, uh, the buffalo became a, a, uh, a source of food for our settlers that settled the West, and they roamed the Great Plains. Well, as civilization, civilization moved, we know that the buffalo population declined. Well, somebody or several people decided uh, well before ESA was put in place that the buffalo needs to be uh, uh, preserved. And so they set up taking buffalo and reproducing on farms and so forth. Nobody, to my knowledge, suggested that we should wipe out the Great Plains and have the buffalo run the Great Plains. So we now have buffalo, which is now a commercial product. You can buy that virtually any place in the country. Let me suggest to you that the reason why that is done is because we have hatchery buffalo. <laughs> so, so, what I, so what I would suggest, if we simply take the adjective wild out of salmon, and put all salmon together as a number, uh, a number of uh, salmon coming back, I think we'll go a long way to solving our problem because there's a great deal of hypocrisy between that. So Mr. Chairman, thank you very much and members of the committee for uh, inviting me to testify. I yield back. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your testimony and thank you for your uh, service to our country. 
let's see, um, Mr. James, you are now recognized for five minutes. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dan James. I'm Deputy Administrator of the Bonneville Power Administration, and I really am pleased to uh, be here today to discuss the continuing contributions of the federal hydroelectric power to the economy and the environment of the Pacific Northwest. As uh, uh, Mr. Newhouse and Mrs. McMorris Rogers have so eloquently stated, as has Mr. Hastings, uh, BPA was created in 1937 to carry out Franklin Roosevelt's vision for harnessing the power of the Columbia River. In successive generations, the value of the river has been expressed in ways that met the challenges of the times, bringing electricity to homes, to rural homes and farms. I, I have met people in my life who can say, I remember when the lights came on. Powering the factories that built the ships and planes that won World War II, mm -hmm. developing the interregional power exchanges between the Pacific Northwest and California, delivering the benefits of the Columbia River Treaty, enabling the development of additional renewable resources, and restoring the fisheries and wildlife so prized by the people of the Northwest. Today, hydropower generation, along with the other authorized purposes of the Columbia River power system remains the workhorse that powers the economy of the Pacific Northwest. And I'd like to uh, call my attention to three key attributes of hydropower that make it especially valuable in the evolving Western electricity market. First, hydropower is reliable and dispatchable. Columbia River hydropower provides dependable electricity generation around the clock through every season of the year. Second, here in the Northwest, our coldest weather can last for many days as high pressure systems hold over the region. Also, heat waves, including those we experienced this summer, drive peak demand for electricity, requiring sustained generation for many days. The hydro system is capable and in fact is planned for meeting sustained periods of high demand. The Columbia River power system delivers carbon-free peaking capacity that is difficult to replace with alternative renewable resources. There is no comparable source of firm, reliable power available that delivers the same value at anywhere near the cost of the Federal Columbia River hydroelectricity system. And not far from here, the four Lower Snake River dams supply up to one quarter of BPA's operating reserves. Without the flexibility and operating reserves that these dams supply, the region would lose a sus substantial amount of its ability to deliver reliable energy, including the balancing of variable energy resources. Second, hydropower is fundamental to the regional economy. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, low-cost hydroelectric power has been a major asset for this region's economy since the Great Depression and the days of World War II. Today, federal power continues to serve many remote rural communities across the Northwest who have few other economic advantages to offer industry and business. And third, hydropower contributes to the clean energy economy. Responding to state mandates, federal incentives, and the declining cost of technology, much of the West is attempting to meet clean electricity goals through other renewable resources such as wind and solar. As these variable resources grow in the Western interconnection, hydro offers adaptable operational capability to integrate them reliably and at low cost. Now I'd like to turn to the success of fish and wildlife investments. The federal hydro system is also unique in the extensive modifications and operational changes made for the protection and enhancement of fish and wildlife. BPA's ratepayers invested billions of dollars to improve design and operation of the dams. The trend of salmon and steelhead survival is on the rise. We continue to post returns that by some measures are near the numbers seen before Bonneville Dam was built. Still, federal hydropower operations are subject to ongoing litigation <clears throat> excuse me, and environmental review. In 2018, court ordered spill above the level specified in the current biological opinion was valued at $40 million in lost revenue. It resulted in BPA implementing program funding reductions and a $10 million surcharge in its power rates. Now, I'll conclude. 
I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this hearing. The Columbia River hydropower system continues to deliver on President Roosevelt's original vision to benefit the people of the Pacific Northwest, while also driving our modern economy and contributing to the quality of life that we so greatly value here in the Northwest. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Ms. Flores, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Lambert, Representative Newhouse, and Representative Kathy McMorris Rogers. I really appreciate the opportunity to come this morning and talk to you about not just the benefits that the federal hydropower system provides, but some of the issues that it's facing, particularly in the courtroom. River Partners support salmon restoration policies and actions that are based in sound science to ensure that the measures being taken will provide demonstrable benefits to the salmon and wildlife we're trying to protect and to ensure that they are a good investment of ratepayer dollars. Sadly, I'm here today to tell you that decisions surrounding the operation of the federal hydropower system and endangered salmon that affect every person in the Northwest are currently not being made based in sound science or cost effectiveness, but by a district court judge in Portland, Oregon. And anti-dam forces are once again trying to make the Snake River dams a scapegoat in salmon and now orca restoration efforts. So I appreciate the opportunity to share some of the actual facts surrounding these issues with you this morning. I would like to uh, tailor my remarks to two issues, spill operations at the Federal Hydro Projects and then dam removal. And when I talk about spill operations, I want to uh, emphasize that the spill levels that we're at right now are absolutely a case of diminished returns for both the endangered salmon we're trying to protect as well as Bonneville's customers. Today, the federal hydro system is at great risk, driven by over 20 years of ESA litigation and court rulings, which have derated the system already by over 1,000 megawatts, increased Bonneville's rates roughly 30%, in just the last few years and have created huge uncertainty over how the federal hydro system will be operated and at what cost to customers even next year. That is because the federal hydro system, as I mentioned, is being run from the bench in Oregon District Court based on spill injunction motions that are being brought by national and local fish advocate and anti-dam groups. So even this year, the Oregon District Court, as Dan mentioned, granted a motion that forced the federal agencies to operate the federal hydro system to maximum spill levels allowed by law on a 24-7 basis for six weeks during the spring run. What is spill? Spill involves raising large gates at the dams which allow water and young fish to shoot out over the spillways. The theory is that spill will hasten juvenile salmon migration downstream to the ocean and result in more returning adults. However, spill also adds dissolved gas to the water, which can give young fish the bends, like divers, harming or even killing them. So spill is like medicine. The right amount can help you, and already we are spilling 30 to 40 percent of the Columbia and Snake rivers. But too much can hurt or even kill you. So here's the rub, as Congressman Kathy McMorris Rogers noted in her statement. There's no proof that more spill will be better for salmon. NOAA Fisheries Science Center modeling of this year's court-ordered experimental spill operation showed there would be little to no impact on salmon survival. The Corps also found it nearly impossible to operate the system at maximum spill and routinely exceeded state total dissolved gas standards that are in place to protect endangered fish. Dan's already covered the cost of the spill and the spill surcharge. I would also note that the added uh, experimental spill operations added 840,000 metric tons of carbon to our skies, which is a 1.7% increase in Northwest electricity sector emissions. Now let me quickly turn to snake dam removal. Anti-TAM groups continue to present snake dam removal as a silver bullet that will save the Northwest endangered salmon and now orcas. It is a false premise, but a powerful fundraising tool 
for some of these organizations. There is no science that supports removal of the dams as the best means for salmon recovery. Don't take my word for it. I'm obviously here because I support those dams. But last fall, Dr. Peter Kariba co-authored a paper with a UCLA graduate student, Valerie Carranza, entitled Fealty to Symbolism is No Way to Save Salmon, and I would submit, by extension, orcas. With your permission, Chairman Lambert, I'd like to enter that paper into the record. With no objection, so ordered. Here are some key points from Dr. Kariva's paper. Quote, there is no doubt dams have caused salmon declines, but the operators of the dams have spent billions of dollars to improve the safety of their dams for salmon, and it is not certain that dams now cause any higher mortality that would arise in a free-flowing river. That's right. Where we're at now, based on NOAA Science Center analysis, is uh, all of the improvements that have been made to the dams means that salmon are surviving at levels that are similar to rivers like the Fraser that are undammed. He also said the problem is that a complex species and river management issue has been reduced to a simple, symbolic battle, battle involving a choice between evil dams and the certain loss of an iconic species. And he also says it has become clear that salmon conservation is being used as a means to an end, dam removal, as opposed to an end of its own accord. Dan has already covered I th I'm afraid we'll have to conclude at this point because okay. the time is up. But oh, thank you very I'm much. I'm sure you'll have some questions, or at least I anticipate that you can uh, finish up with. Okay, thank you. Sorry for All going right. over. Finish up those thoughts. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Johnson, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of Congress. Welcome to the 4th Congressional District. It's my privilege and honor to speak before you this morning on, on a critically important tool. My name is Chris Johnson. It's my privilege to serve as president of the Association of Washington Business, the state's largest employer association, representing nearly 7,000 employers, small, medium, and large, throughout the state of Washington. Those employers employ just over a million Washingtonians. I have a couple thoughts I think are vitally important to our discussion today of the Columbia Sink River Dam, and they come from two perspectives. First, as a former Tricidian, I know how important the dams are, not only to this community, but really serve as the lifeblood of this region. Second, as the president of AWB, Washington's oldest and largest statewide business association, I can tell you that these dams play not only a critical role for the Mid-Columbia, for the state, but for the entire Pacific Northwest. These dams have fundamentally transformed our state's economy, opening new opportunities not only to agriculture, but also manufacturing and high tech. And I believe we all share the same goals, clean energy, a healthy environment, a sustainable future, and a strong economy and that's what we enjoy right here. Washington's employers and families have taken great care to protect the air, water, and land through the generations. It's something we hold seriously. It's not an either or issue. We can have healthy rivers and a healthy economy. Construction of these dams required a great deal of forethought and hard work from those before us. Investments in the dams laid the foundations for a strong and robust state economy. Low-cost power has been a key competitive advantage, attracting high-tech and manufacturing jobs throughout our state. In fact, Washington's manufacturing sector employs over 286,000 Washingtonians with an average compensation of $87,000 a year. These are great family wage jobs that we enjoy. In fact, the total output from this sector was $58 billion in 2016. And the high-tech sector employs just over a half a million Washingtonians, again, statewide. And as you came into Pasco today, you happen to see that we're surrounded by rich, vibrant farmland, vineyards, and food processing industry, all made possible because of the dams. In fact, Washington farmers are proud that they feed the world, whether it's potatoes, wheat, apples, milk, or so many other key important products, we're proud that we're a part of feeding the global economy. This is also the heart of Washington wine country, and I know when you choose to have a glass of wine at the end of the day, I'm sure you're choosing a Washington-based wine. <laughs> We're the second largest producer of wine in the country. In fact, today there are 900 wineries here in Washington State with 55,000 acres of grapes. In fact, the wine industry is critically dependent on two things, irrigation and dependable water, and they get both of those here. So the dams provide low-cost, clean, renewable energy. In fact, nearly 70% of Washington's electricity, 70%, comes from reliable, clean, renewable hydropower, 
which accounts for 40% of the hydroelectric generation in the entire United States. As we've heard today, Washington, Washington is a trade-driven economy. In fact, trade represents 40% of all jobs in Washington and is the largest single driver of the state's economy. The dams are a critical component for trade. They serve our growers, our seaports, moving Washington products to market with a limited carbon footprint. In fact, 60% of Washington's wheat harvest, which has just finished, is worth billions to the economy and moves by river to the West Coast ports where it's sent around the world. And the dams provide a valuable recreation opportunity. It provides a quality of place, a quality of life, and we enjoy that in our state. Families enjoy boating, fishing, and other recreational activities that all drive local economies. So for those reasons, we support H.R. 3144 to protect the Columbia and Snake River dams. And I want to thank Representatives McMorris, Rogers, and Newhouse for your hard work and your leadership on this specific issue that passed the House on a bipartisan vote earlier this year. We also vigorously support your appropriations provision to stop the spill order and hope our senators will accept this compromise language to provide certainty for our river system. It took strong visionary leaders to build the Columbia and Snake River dams, the results of which we enjoy today. They have proved hugely successful, producing powerful results for our state and our region. They've been transformative, they've been a catalyst, and they've been dynamic to our state's economy. They're powering our homes, our communities, and our economy. On behalf of Washington's employers and the employer community, we urge you to continue to support the Columbia Snake River system. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Spain, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Um, I have the honor to represent much of the West Coast commercial fishing industry. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the salmon fisheries. And the Columbia River is our lifeblood as well. Uh, so I think the uh, name of the, the uh, panel here is, is quite appropriate to our interest as well. A little bit of background. Salmon is a powerhouse in our commercial fishing industry, not just here, but keep in mind that when salmon migrate out, the juvenile salmon go north and south. So we're talking about an impact. The Columbia River essentially has an impact through its salmon runs all the way up into southeast Alaska and all the way down to central California. Uh, in fact, about 58% of the salmon that are harvested in Alaska come from the Columbia. It is still and once, and, and once was the third largest, excuse me, the first largest salmon producing river in the world. And so we have that to, to, um, to uh, look forward to. In the last few years, our industry has been on the order of between 500 and 600 million dollars in terms of just ex vessel wholesale, if you will, value of the salmon landed in all of our three states uh, and, uh, and Alaska. And that amounts to more than um, $1.25 billion in economic benefits. That, however, is only a fraction of what is the potential productivity for salmon in the river. As you probably know, the original estimates are that between 10 and, and uh, 16 million uh, salmon returned to the Columbia River historically, we're down to about between 1.5 and 2.5 million now. So we've lost more than 80% of the productivity of the river system. The question is not the benefits of the dams or the benefits of other values in the river. We all know those have great benefits to society. The question which you've raised and everyone has raised is how can we make those coexist truly with salmon runs? And there are a multitude of things that are being tried, and there were uh, a number of things that need to be tried in the future. Uh, we can't stop the clock and go back in time and rely on old science. It's pretty clear now, and increasingly clear, for instance, that spill is a substantial benefit. Uh, I uh, cited in note uh, 2021 some recent studies. Uh, and I want to read into the record a, a, a sentence, uh, a paragraph from a letter from 47 of Pacific Northwest most prominent regional fishery scientists, um, which I uh, re referenced. It's an August 16, 2017 letter I referenced in my uh, comments. In this letter, the undersigned scientists and fishery managers reaffirmed the benefits of spill for salmon and steelhead 
of the Snake Columbia River Basin as an essential interim measure awaiting a legally valid, scientifically credible long-term plan. Specifically, we support an immediate increase in spill levels to benefit Snake and Columbia fish for reasons described more fully below, a reference to the comments themselves. Uh, increased, increased spill allows more juvenile salmon to pass dams safely via spillways rather than passing through powerhouses or bypass plumbing. With existing dams in place, spill offers the best potential to improve life cycle uh, survival. That is the consensus right now of the scientific community. Given that fact, to jettison spill as a tool and return to a discredited, essentially scientifically obsolete plan is not good policy. I uh, respectfully uh, have to uh, 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 object to the kind of uh, policy work that has been proposed in the past that way. What we have is potential unexpected consequences from eliminating spill. Number one, keep in mind that the Pacific Salmon Treaty with Canada is an important element of Columbia River uh, restoration. And the restoration elements in that treaty provided for by international law with Canada are being essentially abrogated by not using spill as a tool. Uh, it means a reduction in survival rates, which means we could go backwards. There have been very modest improvements in the runs because of a lot of the efforts, but we could easily slip backwards, particularly in adverse environmental conditions such as we're facing this year. Uh, that means we could potentially be wasting literally billions of dollars of ratepayer uh, efforts for the past several years by going backwards in terms of our recovery efforts. Another thing is that it is likely to require more water. If we're not using the water at the spillways wisely, the science is fairly clear that it will require more water from the upper basin to go through this system in order to improve those survival rates, the equivalent of what spill could produce. So you are potentially, again, once again, pitting lower river versus upper river interests in a water fight that has no end in sight. We can do better than that. We need a collaborative approach. We need to look realistically at all the science. We need to real, realistically look at all the policy decisions that are out there for us. And those are in the works now. To interfere with that with the legislative process would, in my view, be a serious mistake. Thank you. OK, thank you. Mr. Rich, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairman Lamberton. Representative Morris Rogers, Representative Newhouse, thank you very much for this rare opportunity uh, to get to be uh, in district here and to have a, a panel such as this uh, get to share the uh, expertise and the background of the uh, uh, operation and views of the river. Some, some incredible information shared. Um, I work for Shaver Transportation Company. We're one of the many barge lines that work the Columbia Snake River system from Astoria, Oregon, all the way to Lewiston, Idaho, a 465-mile deep draft system up to Vancouver, Washington, shallow draft barge system all the way to Lewiston. Um, and as we're all aware, they transit through uh, eight navigation locks at the federal facilities, four on the Columbia River system and four on the uh, lower Snake River system. Uh, I'm also uh, fortunate enough to be the current president of the Pacific Northwest Waterways Association, and we represent uh, a wide variety of uh, transportation, agricultural, and port interests uh, <laughs> along our coast and up our Columbia Snake River system, and uh, again, very thankful to be able to be here today. Um, we're a six, now a sixth-generation family-owned company, so when, uh, when I think of how our company, uh, amongst many others here on the river, relate to the agricultural interior. Uh, uh, Representative McRogers, you, you mentioned you're a fifth generation family and, and uh, that goes back a long way. In other words, there's been a lot of change. There's been a lot of adjustment made in the, uh, uh, the work that your family has done uh, if they've had the exposure to agriculture as our family has had in marine transportation on the river. Uh, I think of the, uh, the 1,500 ships a year that call the Columbia River system uh, for many of us in the upper reaches here, we don't get to see those ships, but we get to see the benefit 
of those ships calling the lower river, and that is the export of agriculture from this area. Uh, there are 27 river elevators that receive wheat by truck from the inland uh, to load barges between the Dalles and uh, the uh, uh, port of uh, Lewiston, Clarkston. So there's a lot of barging activity that goes on in the river. There's, uh, in any given year, 12 to 1,500 commercial barge tows a year transiting the river. And as I mentioned that number, it sounds like a pretty big number, uh, but you're running about three, four, maybe five a day uh, going up and down the river. That's departing from Vancouver. Uh, kind of a silent service uh, that sees an incredible amount of cargo moved on the river. Uh, we're a dual feed barge and rail system. When I mentioned the ships that call the lower river, uh, the majority of them are taking exports, exported agricultural products out of our region here. Uh, also receiving those products by rail. 40% of the wheat that is exported out of the number one wheat export terminal in the United States, which terminal meaning the Columbia River uh, exports uh, terminals downriver, um, of that 40% is moved by barge from the inland, 60% by rail. Where you have barge and rail, you have competition. Where you have competition, you have competition for work that, it, that uh, creates a better balance for shippers and gives opportunities. Though opportunities in the Snake River Basin, uh, as far as wheat exports go, not so much. If, you, uh, if you're a wheat producer in Whitman County, uh, if you're a wheat producer in Columbia County, you're shipping by barge. That is your option. Uh, there isn't a short line railroad for you to go to. You're not going to be moving to trucking. If trucking was more efficient than rail, if it was more efficient than barging, it would be trucked all the way to the elevator. Um, all the way to the elevator down in Portland, a six or seven hundred mile round trip. That is not what we see. When it comes to uh, trucking, you're looking at 149 miles, 149 miles for a, a gallon of diesel to move a ton of fuel. For marine transportation, inland marine transportation, for barging interest, you're looking at uh, 576 miles. I can't find a more uh, valued reason for keeping barging in effect. If we're concerned about the, uh, the volume of fuel that's used, the volume of, uh, of emissions that are going into our air, uh, inland barging is certainly the most uh, environmentally responsible way to go. I'm going to, um, I'm going to end with a, a, a little written piece here that uh, I put together here. Uh, I've given you a lot of facts and figures, but I just wanted to leave you with a little piece of heart. As a multi-generational family-owned company, we directly relate to the family farm producers and shippers that we serve here in the Inland Northwest. These families, our company, and the river system we know today has grown steadily and sustainably into the primary economic driver of our trade-dependent economy. From the family farm producers of Eastern Washington and Idaho, who have no other access to the Pacific Rim markets but through barging, to our crews that depend on our jobs for their livelihood, it's with great respect and pride that we serve the Columbia River system. Again, I thank you for this opportunity to share, and we look forward to uh, questions uh, later on. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chairman Oben, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be before you here, uh, Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is McCoy Timuni Oatman, and I am um, first serve as the Vice Chairman for the Nespers Tribe. I've served on council for uh, um, 10 years now, and um, I guess I, I would be uh, a remiss, you know, you guys have our written testimony, but I would, the Nespers people, you know, are a people of the heart, and so um, being here today, you know, I have to, I have to speak from my heart. And I come from uh, a treaty signer, Old Chief Looking Glass, in 1877, uh, he signed the treaty, and he actually rode all the way back from Buffalo country to Walla Walla to ensure that we had a, th that the treaty was adequate. And so I come from seven generations from him, and during the treaty time, he said that I'm looking out for uh, those that are not yet here, those that are unborn. And so I'd like to think that his foresight and knowledge and the other treaty signers as well we're looking out for me and, and the future generations. And so um, I understand, you know, what you guys are trying to do, you know, for con your constituents and for those that are here today. And what I am here, I am here to speak for those that are not here yet, those that are yet unborn, and to ensure that they have a way of life 
past past uh, the time that I am here. Um, there are only 3,500 or so Nespers that walk this earth. And so if we ourselves were a fish species, we would be uh, considered, you know, endangered. And so we, we deal with a uh, high rate of diabetes, heart disease, and you know, a lot of that goes back to our diet, you know, a lot of uh, processed foods and things that our bodies weren't able to handle. And so salmon play an integral part in that, you know, in, in, in how we live. And traditionally, nest purses, we used to bury just right off the streams up on the hillsides and we would bury in rock. And the reason that we would bury ourselves in the rock is so that when, when, the, when the water came through and it washed our bodies back into the river system, and as we all know, you know, how to fish, know how to, they, how to get home. Well, it's by their sense. And so we would provide ourselves to be part of that life cycle and be nutrients for the salmon and also provide them a way of how do they get home, you know. There's been mentions of other tribes, you know. There's, there's the accords that the other tribes signed. Well, the other tribes don't live above uh, all these dams, and the Nespers do. And so it, it's a battle that we have to, you know, continue to fight. You know, when uh, Lewis and Clark came through, old Looking Glass's father, his name is Werkumpt, and he gave, he gave Lewis and Clark uh, a token that they would be able to pass through the Columbia system. And then, when, you know, when he passed, and his, then old, the, uh, old Looking Glass's son was born. But he got his name because Lewis and Clark gave him a medallion. And so after that, he wore that medallion, and then he became known as Looking Glass. And his uh, son, Young Looking Glass, uh, was the one that was in the War of 1877. And I am a descendant of his brother who made it all the way into Canada when uh, they were chased by the cavalry. And then they come back, uh, back to Idaho, and then that's where I'm able to be here today. You know, And so this, this hearing is, is really important. It's really important to hear uh, from, from all parties, but also in particular from uh, the nest purse, you know, the ones that have been here for tens of thousands of years, you know, th that, that's been recorded. And so I want to continue that future for my people, for my children. I have three young daughters, six and three and one. And so it is my battle here today to ensure that they have a future, that there will be fish in the waters for them, you know. And we have our own scientists, we have our own biologists that have been part of this process, that have been bar part of the meetings that uh, deal with spill. And so we want to continue in that collaborative fashion. You know, we've had our day in court, and so we we understand what others have been saying about you know the courts running the system. Well, sometimes you know there's no other way place to, for us to go if if people aren't going to listen to us as a people that have been here for so long that understand these systems. And as as uh, Mr. Hastings uh, uh, mentioned earlier about Buffalo, well, I serve on a uh, interagency Buffalo management plan, and. Um, those are the last pure genetic species, you know, uh, buffalo in Yellowstone. The other buffalo, you know, have been bred with cows, and so it's not really a fair comparison. We call those beefalo. They're not actually referenced as uh, buffalo uh, where we come from. But um, I thank you for allowing me this time to come and talk to you and to talk to the public as well. And hopefully nationally people will understand where we're coming from as, as Nespers people. We're just trying to ensure that uh, we have uh, uh, a um, river, a river system that's going to support those salmon, and that also su support the future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman. We will now hear from uh, Mr. Heffling for five minutes. Chairman Lamborn, Congressman Newhouse, Congressman McMorris Rogers, thank you for this opportunity to testify. The United Power Trades Organization represents the trades and crafts, non-supervisory employees at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers hydroelectric projects in Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana. These hydroelectric projects make up a portion of the Northwest Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and are divided up into the Portland, Seattle, and Walla Walla districts. The Walla Walla district includes four hydroelectric projects on the lower Snake River that seem to be the target of most dam removal proponents. The Northwest Division of the Corps of Engineers is a major employer and a huge contributor to the economy of the Pacific Northwest with an annual budget of over $3 billion and a professional workforce of nearly 4,800. The members of the United Power Trades Organization include the men and women who maintain and operate the equipment at the hydroelectric projects in number over 600. 
but this number doesn't include the engineers, administrators, biologists, park rangers, and the hundreds of others whose jobs are directly connected to the dams. Nor does it include the many private companies who by contract also rely on the existence and operations of the dams for their employment. High technology firms such as Apple, Amazon, Intel, Google, and Facebook have located facilities in the Northwest because of the availability of reliable, clean hydropower, creating jobs and boosting economies. The dams of the Columbia River, Snake River system are multi-purpose in that they provide hydropower, flood control, navigation, irrigated agriculture, and recreation. The benefits of the dams cannot be measured by megawatts alone, but in the overall value they provide the region. Hydropower is clean, renewable, and plays a significant role in Pacific Northwest power production. Hydropower supports wind and other renewables by making the peaking power necessary to meet demand. Hydropower turbines are capable of converting 90% of available energy into electricity, which is more efficient than any other form of generation. The cost to operate the Snake River dams is about $65 million per year, which is relatively inexpensive considering the return on this investment is over $200 million annually. Hydropower is not only measured by the total energy produced, it also stabilizes the transmission system and keeps it reliable. High voltage transmission lines require a steady back and forth electrical flow and flexible hydro generation meets the changing conditions to ensure reliability. Navigation is a major benefit of the Columbia Snake River system of dams. They provide 365 miles of navigable water from Portland, Vancouver to Lewis Lewiston. Every year, more than 50 million tons of commercial cargo moves up and down the Columbia and Snake River rivers between Astoria, Oregon and Lewiston, Idaho. A study by the Columbia River Ports identified 40,000 port-related Northwest jobs. Firms that ship cargo via the Columbia River employ an additional 59,000 workers annually. Cruise ships carry 15,000 passengers a year on five to seven day tours of the river, bringing an estimated 15 to $20 million in revenue to local economies. Irrigated agriculture is the economic powerhouse of the West with annual revenues of $17 billion and more than 100,000 employees. It is the dams that provide the water for irrigation and as a direct result helps sustain the economy of the Northwest. The Walla Walla District employs over 1,100 people with over 400 working at the hydroelectric projects. In addition to being a major employer, the district pumps millions of dollars into the local economies. The fiscal year 2017 budget for the district was about $240 million. Removal of the Snake River dams would be detrimental to the large amount of irrigated agriculture, would eliminate barging from Pasco to Lewiston, Idaho, and would damage the electrical infrastructure. Removal of the dams would cause thousands of jobs. Jobs at the dams themselves would be lost. Contracting jobs would be lost. Farm jobs would be lost. And jobs related to the barging of communities will, would be lost. The impact on the region would be devastating. As president and spokesman for the United Power Trading Organization, I can say our organization overwhelmingly supports HR 3144, hydropower, and the dams of the Lower Snake River. But I'm not just a dam employee representative. I'm a senior power plant operator, and I've been working at one of the Lower Snake River dams since 1986. As a power plant operator for over 30 years, I can actually understand how the new technologies installed have benefited fish. The dams have been upgraded extensively and the improvements work since the removal of the dams would provide no benefit to fish survival and makes absolutely no sense to continue studying or considering a non-solution. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Ms. Green, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Lamborn, Congressman Newhouse, Congresswoman Morris Rogers. I'm a sixth generation farmer from Fairfield, Washington. My sons are seventh generation wheat farmers. On our farm, we grow wheat, bluegrass seed, dry peas, lentils, and garbanzo beans. I'm also president of the Washington Association of Wheat Growers, a nonprofit trade association that is comprised of 1,700 members. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify about the importance of the Columbia Snake River system, which provides significant transportation and navigation benefits to our region. The river system is a 465 mile river highway that provides farmers and other producers as far as the Midwest access to international markets. The Columbia Snake River system is the top wheat export gateway in the United States, transporting over 50% of all U.S. wheat to markets overseas. 11 states export through our rivers, which moved over 12 million tons of wheat in 2016. Over $500 million has been invested into Columbia River grain export terminals and barge unloading capacity has been expanded by over 21% in expectation of increased sales in Asian markets. Besides grain, nearly $3 billion worth of commercial cargo is moved across the river system. As wheat farmers, we are dependent upon the barging system to transport our products to export. Barging is one of the lowest cost, most environmentally friendly modes of transportation we have to get our wheat to major grain elevators in Portland, which is the gateway to world markets. A typical four barge tow moves the same amount of cargo as 140 rail cars or 538 trucks using just a fraction of the fuel. Personally, transporting my crop to the market is a notable cost. Currently, I pay 80 cents a bushel to transport my wheat to ports. Even if wheat is at $6, that is a significant expense. Without a navigable river system, barging would not be an option. Farmers would have to substitute rail transportation or trucks to get their wheat to ports, which would be more expensive and less efficient. Having three different transportation options also keeps costs more competitive and reasonable. As price takers who compete in a global economy, we are very sensitive to increased costs to get our products to market. To move the same amount of wheat currently barged on the river system would require 137,000 semi-trucks or, or excuse me, 23,900 rail cars, leading to increased fuel consumption, increased emissions, and increased wear and tear on our transportation infrastructure. The current rail capacity in the Pacific Northwest is insufficient to meet current as well as projected wheat transportation needs, and barging remains the most efficient way to move wheat to the export terminals. The river system is vital to the entire agricultural industry by providing multiple benefits in addition to navigation and transportation, including irrigation and flood control. Agriculture is the second largest contributor to our state's economy and represents a significant component of our agricultural industry nationally. 6% of the Columbia River Basin's yearly runoff is used to irrigate about 7.8 million acres of Northwest farmland. Greater irrigation efficiency in the Columbia River Basin has decreased water use by 10 to 25% per acre over the last decade. Several very large storage <laughs> dams in the Columbia Basin also provide critical flood control benefits. In addition to providing businesses with affordable, reliable transportation to move our goods to market, the dams provide the region's largest source of carbon-free renewable electricity. The majority of the Northwest's renewable energy comes from hydropower dams, which not only is clean, reliable power, but affordable electricity that attracts business to our region. Washington Association of Wheat Growers was proud to support House Bill 3144, legislation introduced by Representatives McMorris, Rogers, and Newhouse with other Pacific Northwest members of Congress to preserve the current operations plan for the eight Lower Snake and Lower Columbia River dams. The current court order forcing these dams to spill more water threatens the river power system and could be detrimental to the infrastructure of our dams and the reliability of navigation on our rivers. We also support Representatives Newhouse and McMorris Rogers' appropriations um, provision to stop the spill order and thank them for their continued advocacy in support of the system. In closing, thank you for the opportunity to testify about the multiple benefits of the Columbia Snake River system plays to the agriculture sector. It literally is the economic lifeblood and way of life for the Pacific Northwest. Our region is blessed to have it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Green. I want to thank all of you for your very informative and um, helpful testimony. Uh, we really appreciate that. 
We will now begin questions for the witnesses. We'll have at least two rounds of questions to allow all of our members to participate and to ensure that we can hear from everybody. Members are limited to five minutes for their questions. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Flores, I have a question for you, and Mr. James, I'm going to ask you to tag on and uh, also respond to it. There's been some discussion about how all the stakeholders had previously agreed to a spill program that was optimized for salmon health, and yet the latest court order from an Oregon District Court judge, according to your testimony, has upset that balance. What are your views? Um, Thank you, Chairman Lambert. Happy to respond. Um, in 2014, uh, a biological opinion was issued that included, among many other things, spill operations that were agreed to by states, the vast majority of the Northwest states and tribes. And those spill operations were developed in a collaborative process with those states and tribes. But what we have seen was the district court rejected that biological opinion, yet again, and instead has been granting spill injunction orders brought by the plaintiffs. And I mentioned the one that was uh, uh, implemented uh, this year, which was 24-7 spill to the maximum gas caps. So we literally do have a situation now where since the biop is being redone, um, operations are kind of up in the air and we're waiting to see if another injunction is brought this year. Thank you, Mr. James. <clears throat> sure, um, as a federal agency, of course, we work with the other federal agencies to follow the law and the, the judge uh, uh, gave us uh, the order and so we operate the river that way. Um, while we, we certainly seek consensus on, uh, on current and spill future operations, we also know that as an agency, um, we have a, uh, we are uh, under risk of being um, uncompetitive in the future in terms of costs of uh, the cost of power that we sell. So at the same time that we were implementing uh, new spill orders, we've also been reducing our investments in fish and wildlife projects. Uh, and we've been, in fact, uh, reducing uh, our agency budget across the board uh, to become more competitive. But that included uh, reducing investments in fish and wildlife um, in order to meet uh, these new um, spill orders. Okay, thank you. And also for the two of you, uh, Ms. Flores, you mentioned that uh, the recent controversial spill order has actually led to an increase in the emission of carbon dioxide. Can you explain that in a little more detail, please? Yes, yes. Um, back to uh, what spill is. When you're spilling water to move young fish more swiftly downstream in their downstream migration, you're obviously not generating power. Um, so because you're not generating carbon-free power, you have to replace it. And if you replace it today, you're replacing it with uh, natural gas and perhaps other thermal resources and natural gas uh, and other thermal resources add to carbon emissions. So if you're spilling, you're automatically increasing carbon emissions. And Mr. James is a BPA um, admin a deputy administrator. Correct. Can you explain that in a little more detail? Well, um, in order to continue to operate the system, we must, um, loads and generation must always balance. You have to have as much coming off the system as you have coming on the system. And so the way that markets work is that you have to put the, the exactly amount onto the system that, you're, that you need. So if we need to buy replacement power at certain times, we need to buy it when we need it. And uh, as uh, as has been pointed out, that's likely to come um, at uh, in terms of cost and availability uh, from a carbon generating resource, most likely gas. And specifically, where has some of those purchases uh, come from? In terms of power coming into the system from from elsewhere. Right. I can't. I can't um, say specifically specific what generators uh, are that they're coming from, but I know that just in general, uh, they're likely to have come um, or, uh, from gas. Okay, I understand. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Newhouse, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd also like to thank all of you uh, for your providing your testimony this morning. It's very informative, and also it's interesting to find out how quickly five minutes goes by, doesn't it? Uh, uh, 
Um, uh, first of all, Mr. James, thanks for being here. Uh, last week I was able to speak with your boss, uh, Mr. Manzier, uh, the administrator of the BPA. He told me that he was working with our governor on, uh, at least for the last several months, on coming up with ways to negotiate uh, compromise, so to speak, to, uh, the, to, to manage the river that could actually increase the, uh, or provide higher rates of dissolved gases um, uh, by managing the, the, the higher spill rates. I just had a couple questions about you know, the, this whole thing, at least a lot of this centers around this increased spill. And so I like Ms. Flora's uh, comparison to medicine. I mean, a little, little is good, maybe too much, not so. Um, so just a couple quick questions first. Isn't it true that uh, some of our federal agencies have stated that 110% saturation of total di dissolved gases could have detrimental effects on, on fish, is, is that? Um, I'd have to defer that to, to the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, which, uh, which sets those gas standards and which, of course, okay. the states then uh, okay. The states then have to uh, abide okay. by. We, we, the states, as you know, uh, then uh, uh, implement those standards and uh, can can in fact grant waivers uh, on uh, on those those gas levels. And so that also, is what is being considered. It's also true that the current spill order mandated by our judge has raised those levels up to 120 percent. Correct. Yes. Yes. Um, your boss stated to me that our governor is now advocating to raise those levels even higher, up to 125 um, percent. And like you said, every state has their own water quality standards to determine what's what the safe level is. But so, so I, you know, I fully understand the the pressure the governor is under, as well as BPA. But the, certainly, the recent uh, news reports of the orcas and that they're they're. Uh, uh, challenges that, for food that they're finding uh, right now. But I certainly find it incredible that we're calling for more spill, supposedly, to help the fish, and yet that places what seems to be a high level of, of t a toxic level of gas in the water. So at the same time we're, we're trying to help one species, we're harming another. And this just doesn't seem to be based on uh, sound science to me, and so uh, I, I guess I, I'm, this is to me the crux uh, of, of the question here. M Ms. Flores, do you have any comments on on, on all of this? You know, if it if the uh, level of gas at 110 is dangerous, tell me more about 125. I'm I can shed a little bit more light on that. Unfortunately, I didn't do it when I was speaking. It is in my testimony, <laughs> but um, the Washington Department of Ecology for dams in the state of Washington sets TDG levels, total dissolved gas levels at 110% gas saturation to be protective of salmon and other aquatic species, lamprey, sturgeon, all the aquatic species in the rivers. Mm -hmm. The federal system is somewhat, somewhat unique in that the Army Corps gets waivers from those standards of 110 to be able to spill up to 120. Um, they, the federal hydro system, uh, with the exception of the mid-seas, which have temporary waivers to exceed the standards now and again, but the federal hydro system is, is the only dam system that is actually spilling as much as it does. Um, so with respect to the discussions, there are discussions going on, as I understand it, with um, Governor Inslee, and Bonneville, and we do know that part of the discussions are intended to perhaps be able to spill at less less than we do now, um, but then the exchange would be maybe spilling at higher levels. We're concerned about uh, going up to the 125 because we're concerned about the science, as you heard me discuss, and what the impacts might be on fish. We want to make sure that the ratepayers that are spending hundreds of millions of dollars every year um, don't undermine those investments by uh, unintended consequences of spilling to even a higher level. 
Thank you. I know my time is almost up, Mr. Chairman, but I just wanted to say that I was at McNary Dam this spring, and the operators of the dam, that was right after the spill order began, uh, were already seeing uh, fish with symptoms of gas poisoning at that point, and that apparently is at the 120 level. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative McMorris Rogers. Thank you, Chairman, and I too want to thank everyone for being here and, and sharing your testimony with the committee. It's, it's very helpful. Uh, I wanted to ask, I have a few questions for just about everybody, but uh, we'll get started with uh, Ms. Flores. I wanted to go to the uh, um, example of the Elwha Dam that was authorized by Congress for removal in 1992. It wasn't until September of 2011 that the dam actually came down. And as we think about this call to remove the lower Snake River dams for the purpose of saving the orca or somehow benefiting salmon, which I was recently in Walla Walla, sat down with the Army Corps again, and they said they don't believe it's going to benefit. It, it would have an, uh, wouldn't have a positive impact on salmon returns beyond what we are doing today. Um, I just wanted you to shed some light on how long you think it would actually take to remove the dams and how much it would cost and, and what, are, what is your sense as far as how we replace the energy from those dams? Thank you, Congressman McMorris. Rogers, um, you're obviously correct. The Elwha, removal of the Elwha Dam took about 25 years. And I would note that Elwha Dam is in no way, shape, or form, and Glines Canyon, similar to the Snake River dams. Those dams provided very, very little um, power output, which went to a local paper mill. There's no navigation, there's no trade, there's no commerce. There just is no comparison. And even so, removal of those dams took congressional authorization, and it took 25 years and appropriations. I find it very um, discouraging, sad, that people are again, when they talk about removing the snake dam, saying, we can do this without congressional authorization. We can get it done by the end of this year. Truthfully, there are people submitting comments into the ORCA record and so on and so forth saying, we can get this done swiftly. That's just not true. Um, obviously, Congress has been appropriating dollars to maintain these snake dams and the other dams in the federal system for years decades. Um, I don't see that coming to a stop. I do believe that members of the delegation fully appreciate the value of the snake dams. So to get an authorization and appropriations, I think would take decades. And I think um, that whole argument that it be done swiftly is uh, just undermines efforts to try and take reasonable measures to help uh, endangered salmon in the Northwest. With respect to replacement power, um, you will hear that we can easily, swiftly replace the output of the snake dams with wind and solar resources. And that is just not true right now. We, c we don't have the ability to store those resources on a large scale. We may, um, but we don't right now, and it may be decades before we have the ability to store those resources. So again, right now, should those dams be removed, it would likely be okay. with natural gas and thermal. Very good. Uh, thank you. I'd like to move to Dan James, uh, Deputy Administrator. Uh, would you also give me your, your thoughts on how easy it would be to replace the energy that is generated at the Lower Snake River dams um, with resources like wind and solar? Do you think that that is possible? What do you think is the most likely replacement? Sure. Uh, I think that it... Uh, Currently, we don't believe that it's possible on a 24-7 basis because um, you know, the system has to operate um, all, all the time. And you, uh, loads and, 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 uh, um, and, on, and uh, um, the system always needs to balance. So uh, the question is, when, w when can you um, provide, um, uh, how do you meet the needs at any given time uh, in the, the hottest day of the year, the coldest day of the year? And uh, clearly, um, if we were, uh, what would be the energy source uh, that would most likely replace these dams? Uh, if we're talking about cost and dispatchability, in other words, what could be there all the time, 
um, the answer is most likely natural gas. Um, on the other hand, the, the system, um, we have uh, lots of generation uh, onto the system at given times. The question is, uh, when do you have capacity? How do you actually keep the lights on? How do you meet needs 24-7? And so capacity is one of the, one of the issues that we must deal are, with. Are you, are you uh, do you believe that we could see blackouts? I'd have to dive into that question a little, a little more, um, and I'd be happy to, um, to give you a more, a more of a substantive issue there. Okay, okay. Thank you, mm -hmm. I'll yield back. Thank you, we'll have another round of questions here. Um, Ms. Flores, I'm gonna ask you one question, then I'm gonna broaden it to some of you uh, who haven't responded to a question yet. But uh, we had a bill recently in our subcommittee and in the full house on sea lion predation. And to me, it was a no-brainer. Uh, if a sea lion is uh, killing literally thousands of salmon, sometimes just biting a chunk out of it and then letting it go, <laughs> or devouring the whole thing, um, when you balance that, uh, and sea lions are not an endangered or threatened species, but they are protected under the Marine Mammal Act, but the salmon are threatened and endangered. So it's pitting one against the other, which is unfortunate. So we had a bill to say if a sea lion can't be removed, because if you do that and it comes back, you don't solve the problem. That in some cases, some extreme cases, lethal uh, force could be authorized. But we had people, even though they professed to support and love the salmon, who voted against that. And I did not understand how if you want to preserve the salmon, you wouldn't want to preserve them in that case as well. But we had uh, uh, a whole number, uh, uh, I don't know, 100, 150 people in Congress who did not support that legislation that Representative Jamie Herrera Butler, uh, to her credit, did introduce, and we did pass it from the House to the Senate. What's your comment on that? Well, I, um, I think it's understandable that it's very challenging and difficult for for people to wrap their brains around the need to lethally remove you know, sea lions. But if you look at the information and the data, it's overwhelming. Um, and it's not just in Astoria or on the Columbia, it's, it's up in Puget Sound. I'm hearing that the um, pinnipeds or sea lions up there are um, taking as much or more than commercial sport and tribal fishing combined of our endangered salmon. We know on the Willamette River that there is a 90% chance that steelhead will go extinct due to sea lion predation. So I can understand from an emotional perspective, but at the end of the day, you know, we need to take tough measures, and uh, we're really happy and we're very supportive of the sea lion bill because we think that's one of those tough measures that needs well, to be taken. I, I was just amazed. Some people say that they want to protect the salmon, but when it came time to vote to protect the salmon, they abandoned the salmon, in my opinion. Uh, Doc Hastings and um, Mr. Johnson, uh, I want to, Chris Johnson, I want to ask you about irrigation. Uh, one of the benefits of the Lower Snake River dams is the benefit to agriculture through irrigation. What would happen to the economy of this part of the country, Washington or even other uh, near neighboring states, if those dams were to go away? Uh, first, uh, respond to the sea lion question here. Uh, and I remember when I was uh, uh, in Congress, I toured uh, Bonneville Dam and saw the sea lions. The first thing to remember is that the sea lions in question at the Bonneville Dam at that time are not indigenous. They're California sea lions. And uh, because they proliferated so much in, in, in California, because they're protected, they had to go someplace to find their food. So these are, non, these are not indigenous sea lions on the Columbia River, and that needs to be taken into account. Uh, let me broaden your question by, by simply saying that um, uh, the Snake River, I forget how many acres the Snake River uh, irrigates, but it's, uh, it, it's quite a bit. But the uh, an analogy to that would be the uh, reservoir behind uh, Grand Coulee Dam, Lake Roosevelt. That irrigates uh, 500 plus thousand acres. Uh, case in point, without irrigation, we wouldn't have an agriculture economy uh, really of any sort. 
we, uh, we, last year, our average rainfall, I believe, was around seven inches, which is lower than normal here in this part of the country. Uh, I think to date, the average rainfall to date is less than four inches here in the tri season. I could be off by a half an inch, but it's still, the point is you have to have uh, water in order to irrigate our diverse agricultural economy. So if you take that away, that would have a huge, huge impact on our economy, no question about it. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, I think a couple things to, to have some perspective on. When the dams were first opened in 1962, the state had about 2.9 million in population. Today it's 7.4 million. The mid-Columbia where you're sitting had 50,000 residents. Today it has 300,000 residents. Those 300,000 residents uh, in this region help produce 600 million pounds of french fries. They go across the country and across the world, right? So that's how transformative baseload power has been to this region and to this state's economy. Thank you. Uh, Representative uh, Newhouse. Um, I was told just recently that there was a meeting last week in Seattle that uh, uh, the, the gist of the meeting was that there's a direct correlation between the dams and the uh, plight that the uh, orcas find themselves in in Puget Sound. Um, so I was going to ask Ms. Flores, could you speak to the nature of the um, Columbia River's fish species as being a, a, a source for a food for the orcas? I think you brought that up in your testimony. Um, I, my understanding is that they play a, a very small role, but I, 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 want, I want to be um, sure about that. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, again, back to the science. Uh, according to NOAA uh, Science Center analysis, uh, you know, the Colombian snake, uh, Chinook stalks in particular, do provide food for orcas, but they're just one of many, many sources and contrary to what you may be hearing, they are actually a bright spot in terms of providing uh, Chinook salmon for orca consumption. So again, you have to go back and look at the actual data and information. Do uh, salmon from Columbian snake provide a food source? Absolutely, but they're one of many. Um, right now in the summer, 90% of the orcas in Puget Sound, their food source is from the Fraser, salmon from the Fraser River. 90%. 90% in the summer. So yes, they do provide a source of prey, but in fact, they're kind of a bright spot in terms of providing um, salmon for orca consumption. Mm. Um, so just to prove that these hearings, people do look at, at the congressional record, I know that six years ago when uh, Chairman Hastings had, had a field hearing on a similar uh, issues, um, Mr. Heffling, both you and Mr. Spain, is that how you pronounce your name, uh, were in attendance at that hearing. Um, and you were both asked uh, whether it was a good thing to have a, um, a judge dictating the management of the river system. You both answered no, and I think in your testimony this morning, Mr. Spain, you, you talked about a collaborative approach. Um, and so what I find strange is that the years of painstaking negotiations that were conducted by both the Bush and the Obama administrations in coming up with the biological opinion um, which worked on by scientists, engineers, uh, uh, Northwest tribes, all the stakeholders involved doesn't equate to such uh, an effort of collaboration. So uh, I guess I would ask your opinion, Mr. Heffling, do you, do you think it does? Do you think it does demonstrate a concerted effort to manage the system in the best way possible for both fish and, and uh, hydropower and all the other uh, uses of the river? Press the button. Yeah, of course we support the biop, and the biop works. Uh, it has been working for many years. I mean, we were returning to record numbers of returning fish, and then uh, the ad the additional spill ordered by the judge. It makes me wonder if what the purpose of the. Uh, outside interest groups are, if they're really trying to recover salmon or if they want to make it worse on them so they have a reason to remove the dams. Hmm. Uh, for one thing, it, all the water spilled, the fish passing through those spill gates have less chance to survive than when they 
are collected at the projects and, and transferred down river by barge. Five times are more likely to survive, so I have to wonder why additional spill would do any good. And uh, not to mention the ad additional dissolved gas. I mean, we, those of us that work at the dams, it's, it's a no-brainer. You see all the spill and you look out there and the down, downstream of the spill gates, you see all these birds which are uh, feasting on uh, smolts that have been uh, killed by, you know, dissolved gas or just the tra trauma from passing through the spill gates. And uh, real quickly, I know my time is short. Mr. Rich, I think it bears uh, more focus. You, you talked about the um, number of trucks it would take to replace the, uh, the barges that move freight up and down the river. Could, could you uh, expand on that just a, a second? Sure. And, of course, it'll, it'll depend a little bit on the size of the truck, but your basic, uh, uh, basic semi where you're 26 to, to 32 tons, uh, with a 3,600-ton barge, uh, you're looking at, I was looking at some numbers this morning, uh, between 120 and uh, about 160,000 trucks. Now, the reason I'm saying 120 to 160 is because you have uh, varying volumes of wheat that are produced each year. But rather than just the, the number of trucks, we think of the drivers, we think of all that it takes to produce those trucks, and we, we get back to the ton mile per gallon of, of trucking. Trucking is very efficient. I mentioned earlier they were 149 miles uh, to move a, a, a ton of cargo uh, on a gallon of diesel. That's come up tremendously in the last several years. Again, Inland Marine Transportation, 576. So when we just look at the fuel consumed itself, um, adding the trucks to the uh, to the freeways um, and at the at, the, at a minimum of 120,000, I actually can't um, I can't imagine what that would do to congestion. You know, when we say the word congestion, that means different things to different people. But at some point, you end up with gridlock. And is it a good goal to have 120,000 semis transiting from the Columbia Snake River Basin to the seven export elevators in the Portland, Longview, Vancouver, Kalama market? I cannot believe that that would be in the best interest of anyone uh, that is interested in uh, supporting our environment. Thank you, and I, um, I yield back, Mr. Rep Chairman. Representative Thank McMorris Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would, I'd like to go back to BPA and spend a little more time on the biological opinion and the work that was done to put that together in 2014. The legislation that we introduced uh, that is known as 3144, would have preserved the current biological opinion until the current NEPA process could be finalized. And I, I would like you to address some of the steps the region took to come up with that biological opinion and uh, speak to the support of the stakeholders. Uh, sure. Uh, the, it was a collaborative process uh, with elements that uh, were reviewed by a number of constituencies. Uh, independent science advisors. Uh, it was supported by most, uh, if not all, constituencies, including most of the states and most of the tribes, to develop the uh, the the the, uh, the 2014 biological opinion. Did um, does BPA support the legislation? Uh, I can't say that I support uh, the bill until the administration takes a position. Uh, we do. Uh, uh, BPA and the other action agencies uh, do support concepts of the bill. Uh, we believe that there is a thorough need to analyze the alternatives that uh, could be beneficial to threatened and endangered fish. Um, we uh, are standing behind and in, in, uh, directly involved in helping uh, the Corps uh, and the Bureau uh, complete an EIS, which, will, uh, which is part of the Columbia River system operation. Uh, which will tell us a lot about the future uh, of the Columbia River system. Um, uh, that bill, the bill would provide us the time necessary to develop a scientifically sound uh, uh, interim experimental spring operation uh, and continue to analyze um, uh, it through the CRSL. Would you, would you speak to the path forward? Because right now we have uh, a a pretty significant dispute over the science. Mm -hmm. And the science that was used in uh, the, you spoke to the independent science advisors, uh, whether it's the Corps, BPA, NOAA, uh, 
the science is suggesting that this additional spill is not benefiting salmon. Uh, and, and yet that is, that argument is out there and we're, we're being forced by a judge in Portland now to test this theory. I know that BPA, uh, well, I know that if BPA is to cut a deal with the state of Oregon, Washington, and others um, to try to avoid further litigation, I guess I would like you to speak to the possibility of us being able to come together as a region to um, reach some kind of an agreement to move forward that will avoid litigation moving forward. Mm -hmm. um well, Administrator Mainzer and others are, are deeply committed uh, to a collaborative regional process uh, that intersects with the uh, Columbia River system operation that we are conducting uh, with the other agencies. Um, I truly believe in, for there to be consensus, um, you know, that we will need, need a very robust collaborative effort uh, amongst uh, the agencies and the, the sovereigns, uh, the tribes, the states, and others. Um, so while we uh, negotiate an interim uh, spill operation, uh, potentially, uh, there is no agreement on what that might look like because there are uh, unanswered scientific, operational, and economic questions uh, as a result of that. We also are committed to a robust uh, EIS process uh, with the other agencies that is a, a public process that many of uh, people in this room are involved with. Um, Glenn Spain, could you speak to the possibility of us being able to negotiate this? Well, I'll point out that there are already some collaborative efforts, uh, Columbia Basin Partnership, of which I'm a member, and several other people have representatives there as well. The Columbia Basin Partnership is an ongoing process to try to work around this and envision a 100 year restoration effort. What do we want the basin to look like after all? we fix it. What will it look like fixed? So there are those efforts. Um, I, I want to correct one thing that, that I think needs correction, and that is the judge threw out the 2014 buyout because it was based on an illegal standard, but also the science continually moves forward. We had no anticipation that spill would be as useful or as effective a tool as it turns out the recent studies have shown that it is. That was not factored into the original biop. That will be factored into the next biop. Why, why do you think the NOAA science, the core science, does not back that up? Well, actually it does, and I would refer you to note 20 and 21 of the two recent studies where it is fairly conclusive with broad scientific consensus, including the agencies, that spill is an effective mitigation measure. That was not known back then. Keep in mind that Are the you speaking to the additional spill? Because uh, no one, that is what is, we're not saying go backwards, but we are saying let's, let's, let's make decisions based upon science and what's best for the fish moving forward. There we very much agree, but the old biop was based on old science. Science moves forward. We need to incorporate, and the judge required us to incorporate the best available science. Okay. Thank That's you. That's what we're working Thank on. Thank you. Okay. We're going to start our last and concluding round of questions. Uh, I'll begin. <coughs> And I want to thank Representative Newhouse uh, this morning. Uh, you helped me, um, you led a tour of the Ice Harbor Dam uh, east of the city here. And it was very informative. It was uh, the Army Corps of Engineers were there, the uh, dam um, uh, administrator and other uh, people that were there. We heard a lot about the science and engineering that goes into not just the dam itself, but the efforts to make sure that the fish going upstream and the juvenile fish going downstream have as easy of a road as possible. So it was very uh, informative and fascinating and, and very helpful to this whole topic. Um, I want to ask uh, Ms. Green a question and Mr. Rich, feel free to jump in as well. But without dams on the lower uh, Snake River, Transportation would be uh, devastated. Uh, no, there'd be no barge traffic. W what does that do for the agricultural producers? And are there some areas of production that don't even have access to other transportation at this at this point in time? 
Uh, I would say there are areas um, that don't have access to rail transportation. Okay. I think we all have access to trucks, um, but ha as we've stated, the the increase in the amount of trucks it would take to replace um, to transport the wheat that's currently transported on barges um, would probably be devastating to our infrastructure. I don't believe we have the the highway system to support that. Um, as far as as a farmer, as a producer, um, economically, it would significantly significantly increase our cost of production, our cost to transport that um, our crop to the market. Um, having the the three different modes of transportation, which is you know barge, rail, and truck, they tend to keep each other in check. We're not subject to a monopoly, um, and so I, I'm sure that our transportation costs would significantly increase. Um, we already operate on very tight margins, so that would be devastating. <laughs> okay, thank you. And, and uh, Mr. Rich, real briefly, and then I'm gonna finish up with someone else. Well, the, um, the barge industry, when I take a look at this, I see the, the 13 elevators between the Tri-Cities and, um, and Lewiston. And if those, if those elevators had another way to go that made more sense for them economically, they would take it. I, I look back at the extended lock closure that occurred here on this uh, river, uh, the first one back in 2010-11, there was quite a concern that the barge tweet wouldn't be able to get to market. Um, through a, a, um, a series of efforts <coughs> to educate the wheat's availability, the long and the short of it is over the three month period that there was not barging available, that wheat came down the river afterwards. So it was a rather amazement to our industry to see that when given the choice between paying higher rail or the incredibly high truck prices, and by the way, this isn't a comment about high prices with trucking, it's just a cost okay. of transport. And so to be able to see that the people that had a choice for three months to choose to hold their product and ship it by barge shows how incredibly important it is to those shippers. Uh, and those shippers, th those, aren't just, those aren't just companies, those are people and farmers. Thank, Thank you. you. And my last question is for Ms. Flores. Um, one of the phrases that caught my attention this morning is from a, one of the administrators of the dam uh, this morning, and he said that their goal was to make the uh, the dams transparent to the fish, so that going downstream and as well as coming upstream, it's like as if as if the dam wasn't there. In other words, to make the uh, their course both ways, just as if it was natural conditions in terms of survivability. And I think you pointed out it's not 100%, uh, even in the wild, it's, it was not 100%. Uh, was the old uh, uh, agreement better to achieve that goal, which I think is a goal we all share, than the new spill order from the Oregon judge? In my opinion, yes. And the reason for that is, again, back to the more spill isn't always better. Um, one of the things that more spill also does is it pulls young fish migrating downstream away from the fish slides that have been in, installed at the dams or their equivalent. And we have data, Army Corps data, that shows the highest route of passage at the dams is through uh, over those fish slides. Um, so when you spill more, you are literally pulling young fish away from the highest route of passage. So when the dams were overhauled and two billion was spent on fish slides and, and other bypass means, they actually worked. They're providing very high survivals on the level, as stated by Dr. Kariva, as undammed rivers. Thank you. And it was kind of amazing to see the m movable uh, apparatus. Yeah, what was that called? The movable spillway weirs. Yeah, yes. movable spillway weirs. Yes. Uh, a marvelous piece of technology that helped the fish survive going downstream in higher percentages, which I think is a goal that we all uh, advocate for. Uh, Representative Newhouse. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've, I've got a letter here from the Tri-Cities Legislative Council uh, writing with their support for H.R. 3144, as well as for the uh, passage of uh, some of the critical measures to return stability and certainty to our river power system. I just want you to know that Ledge Council is made up of local businesses and chambers of commerce, public, public utility districts, and economic development organizations. And Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to submit this for, for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, just a couple more questions. Uh, again, thank you, all the panelists, for being here today. Mr. James, uh, I've, I've worked uh, very hard in my short time in Congress to support the Bonneville Power Administration and, and public power as a whole. Uh, Mr. Manzier testified in front of this very committee in, in our nation's capital that uh, H.R. 3144, the legislation introduced by Representative McMorris Rogers and I, uh, to provide certainty and, and reliability for the federal river, river power system uh, would help BPA better manage the transmission system in a more effective and constructive manner. I'm sure you know word for word his testimony. Yeah. Would you agree with that testimony? Yes. Okay. Um, well, let me just share with you that while working on your behalf, I need your help as well. Uh, you have got to be an ad advocate for yourself and by helping to push for this legislation to be signed into law. And frankly, I've not always found BPA support to, uh, for this legislation to be shared as strongly and directly with those who need to hear it most. You guys are the experts and people need to hear from you. So just a, a, a simple question, Mr. James, can I count on you to be a more vocal, steadfast partner in this effort? We uh, will absolutely provide all the information that is asked of us Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. I appreciate that, but we, we desperately need you. Um, just one other question, uh, Mr. Heffling. Um, your, your knowledge and expertise as a testament, to, I think you said, over, to over 30 years of experience in working this river system. It was more than 30, wasn't it? Yes. 37, did I hear that? 33. 33. <laughs> Don't want to age you too soon. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my humble opinion is that one judge in Portland doesn't know how to manage this river system better than the experts and the professionals, uh, the, the workforce who work day and night to keep the lights on for the entire Pacific Northwest. Did, did you have any thoughts on, on that? Yeah, that? It's just that uh, a judge or outside interest can't know how all of the improvements that have been put into place work and how they actually benefit fish. Those of us that are there every day operate this equipment, maintain this equipment. Uh, we see the results. We see how it works. We see how the fish pass. So I would just say that we see it works. So uh, I would think we'd have a better idea of what works, what we should be doing. And besides that, we have the fish passage plan that uh, we always follow when doing anything. What units we run, what load we run them at, what spill gates we operate. Uh, it's all part of the fish passage plan, and when we move outside of that, I don't see how anybody can determine what's working if you're not using a established plan and finding out what the results of that plan are. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a complex system to say the least, isn't it? Yeah, but thank, thank you very much, and thank you for your years of service in that effort. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, and we'll have the final questions from Representative McMorris Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think in my final question, I would just like to reflect a little bit on the importance of that established plan. And since, uh, since the salmon were first listed, and you think about where, well, we've reflected this morning a lot on the Columbia Snake River system and all that it means to us, uh, the lifeblood of our economy. It's the foundation of our economy, whether it's agriculture, manufacturing, technology. We've reflected on billions of dollars of investment in research and in technology to improve the fish runs. We have highlighted that fish runs are improving across the board and that we've actually seen fish runs that exceed when the dams were actually built. Um, why I believe it is so important that we get the biological opinion in place and get uh, is that the, the certainty that we need. And 
for me, the, the question is, who is going to be the one putting this plan in place? Um, and so we've been in the court now for a couple of decades trying to get a plan in place. And we continue to, to, to run up against a judge uh, who thinks that they know better as far as how to manage the Columbia Snake River system. I guess I want to start with Ms. Flores and ask you, um, would you, sp and I want to ask others too, as time allows, would you speak to the financial impact on BPA that is passed on to the um, Pacific Northwest ratepayers due to the litigation? And what is the potential risk if litigation and unpredictable court rulings, uh, what, what is the impact of that continued <coughs> litigation on our uh, hydropower generation and BPA solvency? Yes, um, as I noted in my, in my comments, uh, Bonneville, in part, Fish and Wildlife is a prime driver of uh, recent Bonneville rate increases. So over the last few years, they've had to in increase their rates by 30%. Uh, there was a 5.4% rate increase for 2018, 2019, and then we had the spill surcharge. And all of this is adding to Bonneville's current financial woes. And so what I would say is of even more concern is the possibility for future rate increases. Can you imagine not knowing how the federal hydro system is going to be run next year? That's amazing to me. Um, so we don't know exactly how much more that might cost, if anything, but we are very concerned about the prospects for future rate increases, which then contribute more to Bonneville's financial woes. Contracts with the customers expire in 2028. Customers that purchase all or most of their power from Bonneville, they will be looking for options many years before that. And they want Bonneville to be solid and stable and a preferred choice, but they are obligated, if there are market choices, to go out to the market and get the most cost-effective power they can for their customers. So I think we're all in agreement we want Bonneville to stay healthy and stable, but where this fish issue is going with respect to the biop and litigation, we're very, very concerned about how that will translate into future rate increases and what that means for Bonneville. Mr. Bonneville, you want to address this? <laughs> <laughs> what what, uh, what Ms. Flores uh, raised, we, we describe as um, our efforts uh, uh, manifested in a strategic plan that uh, we released in January of 2018. And what that, uh, the, the thesis statement is for BPA uh, to continue to meet its public purposes, it must be a commercially viable business. That means that we have to have customers. And that means when our contracts expire, our 20 year contracts expire in 2028, uh, that we need, uh, we, our desire is to be fully subscribed. Uh, but as Ms. Flores stated, um, there, there, our customers uh, will have choices. And so our dis we are working very hard uh, to drive our costs down. Uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, we, one of the things that we've done um, is to cut agency spending across the board, including in fish and wildlife spending, uh, to meet our obligations. Uh, one of those obligations was additional spill. So back to something that uh, Chair Lamborn asked me earlier, where, there's, where, there's replacement uh, uh, where does that replacement power come from? Um, that manifests itself both in, um, in revenue foregone, revenue, uh, power that you can't generate and can't sell, and it also means replacement power. So that ends up being a cost. I said that it could come from natural gas, that replacement power could come from any variety of places, could come from wind or solar or other, other hydro, other renewables. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, we knew that it drives our costs. So while, uh, while we drive our costs down across the agency, we have to uh, carefully manage uh, our fish and wildlife portfolio. I'm sorry? 
coal and nuclear too. Oh, sure. Yeah, exactly. It could, it could come from, uh, from, from any number of sources. BPA also integrates uh, 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 the power from the Columbia Generating Station, uh, which is just a few miles from here uh, uh, in uh, the 4th Congressional District. So you're right. It could come from any number of sources, but it is a, a cost driver for us. So while we, we, uh, we uh, manage our costs across the board, um, you know, we have cut departments. We have, uh, you know, so we're selling an airplane. We have done things across the board to uh, do exactly what our customers are doing, which is to uh, tighten their belts. Uh, we must also do that with fish and wildlife, which means that when, um, when we uh, must, uh, we don't, we're not able to sell electricity or when we have to buy it, um, then that, uh, that comes at a, at a cost. So we have to manage that like we do everything else. Thank you. I yield back. Okay, that concludes our questions. Uh, I'm going to ask unanimous consent to enter three reports into the record. Uh, something from the Washington Policy Center, a report from NOAA, an article from the Seattle Times. These talk about the adverse impacts of spill, the relationship between dams and orcas, and the cost of replacing power with wind and solar. Without any objection, so ordered. Okay, without any objection, so ordered. And now I'm going to ask Representative Newhouse to make any concluding remarks, and then I'm going to wrap things up. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn. Thank you, Congresswoman Morris Rogers, uh, both of you, for being here today. I'm going to also uh, thank our witnesses for providing their expert testimony, uh, helping us to. Uh, better understand this complex system we have here called the Snake and Columbia Rivers. I, I think this has been a truly a valuable opportunity to help analyze uh, some of the many benefits that we have that we receive from the river power system. Um, I think I, uh, there was something I picked up on uh, Ms. Flora's uh, comments, and I can't pronounce his name, Pete, Dr. Peter Kariva. Uh, he's, he is, if you didn't catch his credentials, he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts uh, uh, and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. He's a former chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy. Uh, he's current director of UCLA's Institute of the Environment and Sustainability, and perhaps most pertinent, he is a um, former director of conservation biology for NOAA. Uh, at their Nor Northwest Fisheries Science Center, uh, where he analyzed the uh, Northwest endangered salmon. And he wrote this just, I think, last year. And I think this is what you referenced, Ms. Flores. And I quote, it is not certain that dams now cause higher mortality that, than would arise in a free-flowing river. The problem is that a complex species and river management issue has been reduced to a simple, symbolic battle, a battle involving a choice between evil dams, and the certain loss of an iconic species. It has become clear that salmon conservation is being used as a means to an end, as opposed to an end in its own accord. And I end quote there. Now, while, while some interests will continue to try to claim that we must pick one or the other, fish or dams, we know that that does not have to be the case. We can indeed balance economic prosperity as well as the environmental stewardship. Fish and dams can co coexist. We see that happening every day. Uh, the Snake and Columbia River system is a great example of that. So I have an ask. I'm encouraging all the members of this community to use their voices to be heard. I will continue to implore our senators Cantwell and Murray to help stop the spill orders, to protect and to save our dams, and to recognize the magnitude of the benefits that are received by both rural and urban communities on both sides of the Cascade Mountains that we get from our rivers, as they really do provide for our way of life. And I would ask you to do the same thing. And I want to thank all of you, our witnesses, everyone in the audience uh, has been here this whole morning. Certainly want to thank the uh, Pasco City Council for allowing us to utilize this beautiful facility. 
thank you, Doc, for letting us be in your old gymnasium. Uh, it's, it's been a pleasure to be here, and I want to I truly express my appreciation to you, Chairman Lamborn, for being here, and as always, my good colleague and friend, uh, uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, thank you for being here as well. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Okay, thank you for your hospitality and leadership. Uh, Kathy, I appreciate uh, what you offered as well. And um, Doc, uh, was, uh, did you start representing Congress in this area before the dams were built? Or uh, <laughs> I know it was a long, t long, long time ago. Long time ago. No, no, but the, the arguments that you hear today are exactly the same as they oh, were 25 okay. years ago. <laughs> okay. Well, I thank all the witnesses for their testimony, and I want to thank the audience for your interest, and please uh, submit any last comments that you might have. If there's no further business, the committee stands adjourned.